So just to, to sort of wake you up, that the first radiograph in 1895, anyone have an idea what it's of? Hand. Yeah, and whose hand is it? Oh, it's supposed to, well, it's supposed to be a um, um, woman's hand, but his wife and the wedding ring. That's what I was told. Okay. And you think it's a cancer, but it's not. It's a wedding ring. There you go. So, um, and the next thing, we, we started sort of using radiotherapy, though, quite early on, but also we realized quite early on there are some side effects. So anyone got an idea what this gentleman's job was? He was a radiographer. Um, and obviously when they were moving the, the, the x-ray plates, he got exposure um, um, to the radiation, and that's little squamous cancers on his um, fingers. And so we, know, we learned from very early on that radiation could be very useful. I mean, they used it for everything. They used to use it for ringworm, they used it for unclosing spondylitis, all sorts of things. But they realized, actually, it needs a little bit of caution as well. So though it's great, we need to learn how to make the, the, the best of it with the minimum side effects. So... How does it work? It's very simplified, um, quite, and quite simple. Um, basically, it preferentially kills dividing cells. It affects the DNA, both directly and also via interacting with the water in cells. And so it, it kills cells that are dividing more than it would kill your normal cells. So it, and it also can be targeted to include the tumour and exclude normal tissues. And that's the goal of what we're trying to do. And so with this, let me just come across with my mic here. What you've got here, you've got your tumour here in the dose. So what you're trying to do, you, get, you increase the dose and you increase the chance of tumour control, but you also increase the chance of major complications. So what you want to do is get your dose of radiation, so, those, so you've got the biggest gap between the two. So you're aiming to control your tumour, but minimal major side effects, and that's the goal of what we do. Because you know there are side effects from radiotherapy. You've got the early side effects, and they're typically the, the, the sort of um, the early reacting tissues. So it's your mouth, it's the, it's the gut. So you might get some diarrhea, sore mouth, hair loss. And these side effects occur during the radiotherapy. Okay? So you can actually adjust these and help during the radiotherapy. You could stop the radiotherapy early. And they depend on the total dose of radiation and how long you give it over. But then we get these late effects three to six months afterwards where the radiation's finished and you actually can't do anything about those. So, and that's tissue, different tissue, typically the nerves, the heart, the bowel. And so that's where a lot of our sort of, um, all the information that we've learned, we try and make sure that we avoid these by avoiding these areas and giving the dose in little bits at a time. And you'll notice if you have radiotherapy, it's not all given in one block, it's given in little bits. And it's all so that we can exploit this try and cure our tumour with our minimum amount of side effects. So, radiotherapy and lymphoma. Most of this stuff is based on Hodgkin's, okay? That's because Hodgkin's lymphoma, we cured it um, pretty early on. And before we had chemotherapy, so 50s and 60s, it was the only thing we had, right? And we cured a lot of patients, but because we didn't have chemotherapy, we had to give very big fields of radiation. And I don't know if you can see here. This is a, an X-ray. We used to plan it all on X-rays, okay? And um, this is a patient who would have had a gland in their neck for their Hodgkins, and they had radiation that covers all the center of the chest, all the armpits, and all the neck. And we used to make these, um, and I still did it when I was training, these customized lead blocks that they made out of, a, 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 out of lead, and they put on the treatment machine, and they were based on drawing on x-rays, and you can see quite complicated, but big fields of radiation, see how much radiation that was. And if you had somebody who had a gland in the groin, for these ones you'd have something we call an inverted Y, you can see why. So you have the radiation all down here. And that was because we didn't have the same, even the same scans then, so to be able to tell where our lymphoma was, you have to examine the patient, and you even had to do something called a staging laparotomy, so you actually had to have an operation to find out where the lymphoma was. Um, we didn't have CT scans. And this here, you can sort of see, kind of see these little white blobs? Um, at one point, the way that they tried to work out where the lymphoma was, was they did something called a lymphangiogram, and they actually injected um, sort of the, the dye into the lymphatics, which must have been really painful. 
And again, that, that showed you where the lymphoma was. So you can see there, really big fields of radiation, very simple. People were cured, all right? But, as you can imagine, a quarter of them relapsed because often they, we might have thought that the disease was up here, but they had something somewhere else. And there were a lot of side effects, both early and late. You can imagine that. So that started to change when chemotherapy came in. Sort of 70s, um, but it was quite slow to adopt, and probably these fields of radiation were still being used. Certainly, kind of, we, we probably gave some mantle field, which is this one, radiotherapy, up until about like late 90s um, here. And so things started to change. And with the advent of chemotherapy, you could shrink down a lot more of the tumour, and you could give much smaller fields of radiation. And you can see there, the fields are much smaller. You still, if you've got a gland in the neck like that top one, you're still um, treating the whole of the neck, but much smaller fields. So you then give chemotherapy to treat the, the, the lymphoma, and then you give radiation to where it was. So much, much smaller. <clears throat> still, though, a bit of tissue we don't need to treat. So the next thing that came along which helped with us are PET scans. And PET scans were really, really good. And what they did is they showed us exactly where the lymphoma was in the body. So we could hone it down even more. And what we do nowadays is we treat something called the involved site radiation. And this was a seminal paper done by one of my colleagues, um, Tim Illich, um, and the great and good of lymphoma throughout the world, sort of um, North America, Europe. And they all got together and they agreed that we could kind of make the fields even smaller. Now we've got PET scans. And so nowadays, smaller again, we call involved site radiotherapy. So even if you had a big lump of lymphoma, you give them some chemo, it shrinks down, and you just give the radiation to where it was with a bit of a margin. So we're shrinking that radiation field down. Still getting the benefits, but less of the side effects. And the other things we can do, a fancy picture, is as you can imagine, tumours don't come in squares, all right? And we used to be able to just treat with these big blocks. They come in little funny shapes. And so what we've got now is rather than just having to, like I said, stick bits of lead to shield the, the body, we could actually do um, something called multi-leaf collimation. I'll just show it on the next one. Is that our bits of lead now, these are little leaves of lead, and they're in the radiotherapy machine, and they can move in and out throughout the, the, the radiotherapy treatment. So you can make all sorts of weird and wonderful shapes. And these can even move in and out through the radiotherapy, so they can change the dose along the field. So we're really clever now. We can actually make um, our radiation fields much smaller, and our radiation fields much, much more accurate. And as you can see here, this is just a radiotherapy plan. It's a bit like a contour map. Um, and here we're trying to treat the stomach, which is the red bit up there, trying to avoid the kidney. And you can see we can shape things much, much better. All right, so I said I'd mention very briefly some trials. I'm going to be very quick about these, because there's been a lot of trials in lymphoma over the years. Now, don't be scared about this next slide. It slightly scares me. I'll tell you about it. Basically, Germans were brilliant at trials for, for Hodgkin's lymphoma. And what they... There's been lots of trials over the years, and this was one of their famous ones. And what they were looking at, Hodgkin's lymphoma again, is were there some people with Hodgkin's who do really well that we could actually cut down the chemotherapy and the radiation. So they looked at giving four cycles of the chemotherapy or two cycles and the standard 30 days, three weeks of radiotherapy and two versus two weeks of radiotherapy. And they showed that they were all equivalent. So the good thing they showed was that actually we could get away with two cycles of chemo and radiation. And all this is doing is cutting things down Still keeping our chance of cure, but minimising our side effects. Now, the next slide, I'm, I think you've had quite a lot said about this. So, very briefly, the, the RAPID trial done in the UK. And this, again, looks at whether some people who we could actually omit radiotherapy from. <coughs> and this looked at some of the patients with Hodgkin's who'd done so well that actually they didn't need the radiation. And what they did is they gave them chemotherapy, did a PET. If it was all clear, they were randomised between getting radiotherapy or not. And what they showed is that when they looked at the people who just who actually had the radiotherapy, those people were slightly less likely to relapse, okay, but only very slightly, um, but they were going to get less of the side effects. So it, it gave some extra information, and it means that we could individualise our treatment. And the last trial I was just going to mention that some of you might have been, I imagine some of you probably had follicular lymphoma, might have been involved in another UK trial, and this was looking at radiotherapy for follicular lymphoma. 
and um, we give it for, for any troublesome lumps of, 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 of lymphoma. And we traditionally gave 12 treatments, um, and we tried to look at a new two-treatment regime, which might have been much nicer, much shorter. And, but when we looked at this afterwards, we found that the two, you can see the two curves there separated out. The patients who had the two treatments, they were far more likely to relapse. So usually now we now recommend 12 treatments, though you can give two in some cases. So it's just kind of an idea of the sort of things that have been going on. So what we've been trying to do is trials to allow us to omit radiotherapy. So if you don't need it, we don't give you it. Better scanning, so we know where to treat. Technical advances to try and be, make our fields a bit smaller. And which I think Laura's going to speak about um, um, next time, any screening or lifestyle changes to prevent any late effects. So if you, what are the reasons? Who would get radiotherapy now, basically? So um, where are the current indications for radiotherapy? So we, we think about lots of things now. So it isn't quite as simple. Everybody doesn't get it. We have to think, have you had chemotherapy? Did you cope with it well? Did you get all the chemotherapy you were supposed to? Are you already cured? Do you not need it? Um, what will radiotherapy adds add? So we can individualize this now. And it depends, again, on the patient's choice. What bit of the body are we treating? Um, and the importance of late side effects. And are there any other possible treatments? There's lots more things now. It isn't quite as simple as it used to be before. So kind of um, in summary, sort of in Hodgkin's lymphoma, we still do give radiation in our early stage Hodgkin's, but it's part of, we have to talk about it very individually for that person. And in advanced disease, it's typically, and I'll simplify that, for the patients that the chemotherapy hasn't worked or where you might have something left after chemotherapy. In those patients, we may consider radiotherapy. Okay? And for non-Hodgkin's, it's still a really big part of, of, of the early stage localised lymphoma. So if you've got follicular lymphoma, malt lymphoma, and you've just got it in one bit, then radiation is still really there. It can, it can get rid of it for you. And again, in the um, higher grade lymphomas, they give it after some short course, course chemotherapy, or if the, if the um, disease hasn't responded to, to chemotherapy. <coughs> so it's a good sort of adjunct to chemotherapy. I'll just put one slide in here. I'm, I think some of you have had a bit of talk on the, the skin lymphoma, the, but T-cell lymphoma, it's slightly different, and we give radiation. It's a completely different philosophy. Rather than being really targeted, we're trying to give it to the whole of the body. And this lovely chap in the corner here is Professor Cowan, who I don't know if any of you know, who is demonstrating the position that people would have the radiotherapy for this. And this is radiotherapy for this type of lymphoma. Often you're trying to treat the whole of the skin. So you're giving, rather than targeting it, you're treating a really low dose of radiation to the whole of the body. So you do it in like four bits. So you have one with your arm up, one with your arm that way, and then come back through in both positions. So he's, he's demonstrating that very beautifully. And that's a radiotherapy um, linear accelerator where you'd be in linear time. So a slightly different um, bit of radiation there. So newer techniques. So I, I said I would mention um, a little bit about... Um, of our new techniques, and the first of these is deep inspiratory breath holds. Now, these slides are courtesy of Guy's and St. Thomas's because we're not, we're almost ready. We're hopefully in the next couple of weeks to do this in lymphoma. So, there are challenges with radiotherapy to the chest, right? The mediastinum is one of the names for this sort of central bit of the chest. It's an area that we give radiotherapy to very commonly. But you can imagine it's a bit tricky because it's got the heart, the lungs, <coughs> the breast, lots of, of, of areas that could cause side effects in the middle here. So anything we can do to improve that would be great. And so what I want you to kind of do now, if you take a deep breath in, if you like taking a deep breath in, you can feel that your lungs expand, chest wall moves out and away from the heart and the diaphragm moves down. And what that actually does, you can breathe out now, by the way, um, what that actually means is that heart goes down and elongates, and that changes the anatomy of the, uh, of the body, and that can be really beneficial for us with radiation if we're giving treatment. So, sadly, a bit of kind of transfer, I haven't got the moving one to show you. You probably know radiation takes sort of um, two or three minutes to give, and unless you're a deep sleep diver, you can't hold your breath for that long. 
So, um, but in free, so it, normally it's given in free breathing. And if in free breathing, I think you can see the shape of the heart, quite globular, the lungs more squat, okay? And this, a deep inspiratory breath hold, like you've just done, lungs much bigger, the black areas, the heart longer and thinner. And if you're treating these glands in the centre, you can obviously treat less heart, um, less lungs, if you could treat them in that position. And this is a technique where we teach our patients to be able to hold their breath for quite a time, and the radiation is just given in that deep inspiratory breath hold. And so we often, it often takes several breaths to be able to give the radiation. And we're just about to get going um, at the Christie with that. Now, it, it's also useful, and I'll show you this in, in breast cancer. This is what a lot of the evidence is. You can see here, this is a... Um, patient having breast cancer radiotherapy, and you can see that little dotted line is the back of the radiotherapy field. And when they're free breathing, you can see the heart gets a bit of radiation, whereas if in deep inspiratory breath hold, it's missed it. So again, this is already being used for, for, for breast cancer at the Christie, but because it's a bit more complicated, lymphoma is a bit more complicated, it's taken us a little bit longer, but you can already see changes of anatomy, trying to cut down the, 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 the risks for, um, for patients. Yeah, I'm just about to treat our bit first one. So, I'm, I'm going very well to time. A bit too fast, aren't I, probably? Never mind. So, um, so, that's always what happens with me. Proton therapy. So, I was told that you wanted to hear a little bit about protons. So, I'll, I'll do my best. These, again, these are from Ed Smith, who's a colleague of mine. He also treats lymphoma. <coughs> um, and he's the clinical director of, the, of, the, of protons at the Christie. And so, these are his slides. So, bear in mind, if some of them I'm not quite as slick with, so, the proton. Well, proton has been around as a treatment. It's not new. It's been around since the 50s. But if you look on there, it wasn't, there were probably only 20 centers worldwide up until 2000. And then they started to sort of take off. So, there's, there's not a lot of evidence out there. There's not a lot of research out there. Okay? Um, and you might say, why didn't people make all of it, uh, do a lot more? of these um, centers. You'll see when you see how much, how big they are and what it takes, why it's been quite difficult. Um, so <coughs> the proton itself, again, it's been around a while, 100 years. Um, it's a, a very large um, molecule and it's stable. And why are we so excited about it? Why do people think it might be useful? Well, the normal radiotherapy we give is that green line, okay? So when you give your, your, your radiation, when it goes into the patient, it gives its highest dose, usually a, a centimetre or so um, into the field, so a centimetre or so into the patient, and then the dose falls off slowly. But even, you can see there, many centimetres out of the field, you've still got some dose, okay? Whereas the thing about protons, it takes a bit longer to get going, but when it drops its dose, it goes to nothing, almost immediately. So you don't have this dose in the rest of the patient, which could be really advantageous. Okay? So um, what that means, and this is a kind of a... The proton properties, you know, it's stopping the patient and we can control this depth. So what it happens is you don't get as much dose beyond it, and that can be really useful in things like um, for kids treating, where you're worried about dose, late effects, they're going to be alive for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. So it can be very useful for them. And it can also be really useful for our adults who have maybe a tumour in the spine that we just can't get the dose high enough in there. So both of those are areas where it's really, really useful. Okay. And this just illustrates it. This is a radiotherapy um, plan for normal, conventional radiotherapy, okay? That red blobby bit is the bit that we want to treat, okay? And you can see it's got the high dose of radiation. It's, it's red, just showing that this is like a heat map. Of, but you can see that the rest of the body, the pelvic bone, the ovaries, are all getting a bit of dose. You can see there are a thousand, they're blue, okay? But when you plan this with... Um, Protons, you can see here, much more closely shaped, and this dose, not getting any dose here, which is uh, quite attractive when we're talking about late effects. And just showing that again, this is the spine, and they're treating a spinal cord tumor here. We've got our liver, our heart, our lungs, and in order to get that 
dose in there, we've had to give dose to all these other bits. It's not big, but they are getting dose there. And this is what they can achieve with protons. So it's not quite as well shaped, but you've got grey areas with no dose in these areas, okay? So you're saying, why don't we just give everybody protons? Um, one is, it is massive. These are difficult, basically, machines to, 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 to build. Um, and um, so just see the size of it there. And also, the trouble is there's uncertainty. We don't quite know where they drop that dose. So the trouble is that you might miss your tumour a bit, and you also might... Um, overdose certain areas, so it isn't quite as good. And the other thing, we just don't have the research and we don't have the information out there. But hopefully with our new, um, hopefully with our new um, um, proton machine coming, we will be able to look at that and we'll actually be looking at protons, um, the outcomes across, across the tumour sites. So the plan is for, uh, to have a full UK service, 21 to 22, and they have two um, UK high energy pro proton centres. There's the one at the Christie's and the one at the UCLH. Will potentially 50 centres will refer in, and that's up to 1,500 patients a year. It's not a lot, but it's a lot more than we had. Okay. And this is the slide. I'll try and talk it all through. This shows kind of what's gone into making this this proton thing. Um, Basically, yeah, everything. I was, my husband was laughing when I was reading this out. Him, he's a, a, a physicist, and he said everything in this country has to be. If it's height, it has to be in double-decker buses, and if it's in volume, it has to be Olympic-sized swimming pools. So, there you go. So, concrete, a concrete pile underpinning, each the height of three double-decker buses. The building weighs more than ten Eiffel towers. The cyclotron weight of a Boeing 747, but the size of an average car, so very dense. Cables. The amount of cabling is the diameter of the orbital M60. And the concrete volume equivalent is eight Olympic-sized swimming pools. So it's a big undertaking, <coughs> all right? Um, and we're, we're getting there, and we should be treating the, next, the first patient um, next year here. I think they're a bit behind kind of in, in UCL. So who are we going to treat? Okay, so we already have a program for protons. It's already been approved. We know it's very useful for the young children and for the patients with um, spinal tumours. So those patients already get shipped overseas, so they're going to be the first people who will be treated. Obviously, we don't want to ship people overseas, but then there will be some other tumours, and particularly where the evidence is currently is in for kids, and that they'll be our first set, and adults with spinal cord tumours. So, but we've also got quite a lot of research time put in there and lymphoma is in there as well. So we're all going to be sort of putting patients through and working out where it's going to fit, basically. So where, the, where protons will fit in the future across the board. So um, that's me pretty much done. Um, radiotherapy has been used in lymphoma for over 60 years. It's still a really important um, component of treatment in 2018. But now we are a bit more selective. We pick out the people who we know are going to benefit. Um, we've got much better staging and advances in radiotherapy planning techniques. So we've got smaller fields, much more accurate, and hopefully less side effects. And, and that's my job. All right. Um, thank you um, for listening. And um, I've got about a minute. For questions? One yeah. minute. Thank you. Thank you.